I became trauma informed, I thought to myself, I wish I knew this as a kid because, and we know Brian talks about this all the time, children's behavior is a form of communication. And it's not, and so we have to look at them differently. And it's our perception of them is what is really important. And I know it's hard when kids are daily, it's a daily struggle and resistance. But when a parent can step back and look at their child, it's, it's not that they won't behave, it's that they can't. They just can't. And I'm an attachment therapist, so I'm always looking at the attachment between the parent and the child. And one of the first things that I do ask parents, and I ask all of you on the call, is to step back. When you see your child dysregulated and overwhelmed, sit back and think and question, what age am I seeing emotionally and psychologically? And most of the time, and most children who've experienced trauma have at least a two-year delay emotionally and psychologically. So you're not dealing with their cognitive age right now. So that's information. Um, so if you know, if you have a 12-year-old and you're thinking, you know, why can't they behave like other 12-year-olds? It's not that they – it's because they can't, because emotionally they're a younger age. So – Having that knowledge is really key. And it's not, and then that's where you're going to approach your child at that age emotionally and psychologically. So if they're 12 and emotionally they're, they act like they're six or seven, well, you're going to go back and think about how would I approach a six and seven year old? They would need more attention, more guidance, teaching of skills. Um, and it's not going to a child and saying to them, I know you're really seven, so now I'm going to talk to you like you're seven. No, that's, it's the parent being mindful and wiser and stronger in that capacity in guiding their child in having this knowledge. So that's so I'm giving you a lot of different pieces of reframing the way you look at your child. And, you know, there's so many words out there. I did a radio show a couple of years ago, and she said, so tell me, what are the issues that children who have been adopted have? And I'm thinking to myself as an adoptee, that doesn't feel good to me. Yeah. Like, I have issues. Yeah. And so for me, and Brian talks about this, he talks about it as challenges. I talk about it, we have vulnerability. Mm -hmm. We have sensitivity that other kids who have not had our early life experience have. So we have vulnerabilities, and we all need to find out what they are for your child, what are their fears, what are their desires, what are they afraid of, what scares them, what's overwhelming. And I'm going to talk about, I have a pizza pie metaphor, as to how to be trauma-informed and look at all these pieces in a structured way so that you can feel, you can focus, you can treat these vulnerabilities and make them stronger so they're less sensitive and more resilient. Um, because what happens is when children have experienced scary uh, events in their lives, trauma gets stored through the senses, and that's the body. And there's a lot of talk about this neurophysiological connection and trauma. So I'm just going to break it down for you so that you can make sense of, okay, here's the piece I need to focus on neurologically. Here's the piece I need to focus on physiologically. Because there's a lot of treatment methods out there, and I have done a lot of research. And as a therapist myself, I want to do best practice, and I want to do work that is effective, research-based, and work-based. So everything that I'm going to share with you today is effective, and it's this multi-pizza-pie approach in the way you need to approach your child. Because it's not just one modality and one treatment. It's, it's, a, it's a pizza pie of a treatment model that parents need to be aware of. Um, so, um, and then here's the thing. When I, as an adult, really look back at my own life, kids with early separation uh, who've experienced trauma, 
we are egotistic. So we will, in essence, blame ourselves unless deemed otherwise, unless someone tells us differently. And I had terrible self-esteem growing up. And I always thought this was my belief system was there's something wrong about me until I did reading and I learned about the the best practice in being trauma-informed in the lens of looking at myself differently. And I went from that phase of what's wrong with me to what happened to me. And that's when I started having compassion for myself. And it took a long time. And for a lot of kids, it's scary for them to look at what happened to them. However, I'm direct with kids. And I do help them understand it, there's nothing wrong about you. And we do need to be direct with kids. It's not about you. It's what happened to you. So that they can also be trauma-informed and look at themselves differently. So a lot of this work also is psychoeducation. So I do a lot of teaching to kids um, in, what, and in helping them understand there are many different approaches that we're going to learn in therapy here that we're going to practice so that you can be informed in the best way possible to help yourself. You can reorganize yourself, soothe yourself, know what to do, and learn coping. Learn how to cope. Because what I tell kids a lot is it's not when I say I have kids come in and, and I go, are you adopted? And and, because I know they're already adopted, but I'm asking them, so tell me, are you adopted? And they go, yeah. And I go, huh, well, guess what? You're not adopted right now. You were adopted. Because a lot of kids walk around with this, I'm adopted, stamp. And they're carrying it like, I'm a foster kid, like it's a condition. So I really help kids separate out themselves from their story, because they're the, they are who they are today. However, they may have had multiple experiences, but that doesn't make them who they are right now. They've had these experiences. They can make sense of these experiences. They can have objectivity, and they can separate, make sense of them, and move through them so that they can focus on their future and not be so focused in the past. So... Um, I just wanted to explain that piece. So uh, why don't I go to starting with the six pieces of the pie that I feel are important for this call today. Is that good? Yeah. So um, the first piece of the pie is being an attachment-focused parent. Um, I am an attachment-focused therapist. So understanding the attachment in the relationship is key. It's, there's a phrase in the attachment community, focus on connection first, then correction, because the connection is key. And I'm going to give you some tools and understanding, especially if you have a child who's experiencing shame, how to really focus on the attachment and helping a child separate themselves from their behavior. Um, So that's the first piece of the pie, how to be attachment-focused, and I'm going to give you some tools on that. The second piece of the pie is creating a narrative for your child's story. Children need to be told what happened to them. And I have some interventions on my YouTube YouTube channel, which is YOF Therapy, Y-O-F-F-E, which you can access a multitude of interventions, uh, and I'll specifically tell you which ones help you formulate your child's story, help them make sense of it, so they can externalize and see their story for what it is and not carry it around. Kids need stories help them work through, make sense, and and see and reframe what happened to them differently. So narratives are really important. Uh, number three, the third piece, is understanding your child's physiological response. Um, and that's understanding and reading their sensory signals. 
So we all, and we all have sensory signals. We all have senses. Our bodies are made up of the five senses and how we experience our world. So we need to be able as parents to read our children's sensory signals. So I'm going to give you some tips on that and direct you in more resources in that area. Number four is understanding your child's neurological response to their experience. And that's based on all the brain research we are recently understanding about how our brains work, how brain impacts behavior. So there's a lot of new trauma practices now, trauma treatment methods, um, and it's the use of bilateral, bilateral treatment, which rewires the brain, integrates that right and left hemisphere, and optimizes the brain's functioning. So um, these bilateral stimulation techniques um, you can do starting tomorrow with your child. I'm going to teach you one together tonight. And and the bilateral approach promotes relaxation and builds stress tolerance. So that's really important for this population. Then there's the nutrition piece. That's number five of the pie. And I'm going to talk about um, right now what's happening in our the world of DNA testing is based on your DNA test, they can provide you with supplements based on your DNA of supplements you may need to have optimum functioning in your brain and your body. And with kids who've had in utero insults and they have been um, drug use, substance abuse, which has impacted that brain development, they may not have received the the mother may not have received the proper nutrition, and they're lacking certain nutrients in their system. So I'm going to talk about a few, and also just diet for kids who have a high stress overload, and why it's important um, to provide good nutrition. And there's a lot of food issues with kids, so I have a great mm. book to re- recommend on that. Um, and then six is parent peer support. Parents. The sixth piece piece of the pie is parents need to help parents. And you're a big piece of the pie. And the more work you do for yourself, the more you fill up your own internal bucket, the more better able you're able to be empathetic, compassionate, and provide that care that these kids need on a daily basis. So your piece is really important, too. Uh, and I'm a parent, we have to do self-care because we can also become traumatized, um, and it's not selfish to do self-care. It's necessary and important to do self-care. So... Jeanette, as you yes. were... As you, I, made the li- I made the list, <laughs> and as you were talking, um, yes. I found myself thinking... You know, um, I'm, I always remind our parents that everything we talk about when we're talking about our kids applies to us too because we yeah. are we all have blueprints. We all have physiological responses. You know, so nutrition and understanding ourselves, paying attention to our own responses and reactions. As she's talking, everything that she's talking about that can help your kids, there are also things that can help us. So I can't wait to just invite everyone to just uh, to hear it from all those perspectives. It's, it's just like this is a great little family wellness. Yes, yes. It's like a little so, family wellness kit we're getting here, and I love it. And it's 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 a blessing for the new year. And yeah, when, oh, thank you. I love it. Yeah, I don't want to overwhelm anyone. I'm just giving you a six piece of the pie multi model approach. And you can choose to do any piece at any time. I have families that are doing me, they come and see me for attachment-focused family therapy. Then they also do neurofeedback. And then they're also doing the supplements. And they're doing this multi-model approach. Um, So there's no cookie-cutter way. You can take any piece of the pie at any time, and you can see what's working and maybe what's not working and pull back. Always focus on what's working, and when it's working, do more of it. Because we're also dealing with complex trauma. It is there's no clear cut one two three four A B C approach. It's using this multi model approach, a little piece at a time, and 
see where your child begins to self-regulate better, be able to be tolerate uh, more affection, able to tolerate more relationships, build their stress tolerance, take more risks, build self-esteem. Once you see these factors developing in your child, you'll know that it's working. Um, and there's another piece. It's, it's how do you measure you're making progress because the emotional brain is, is there's no logic to it. And I always say, and this comes from Dan Siegel's work, is you can always know when you're uh, making progress with your child if their symptoms decrease in intensity. So they're just less intense. Okay. Because it's hard to see that you're you're actually making progress sometimes. Okay. Their, 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 say their meltdowns are just less intense. Okay? So they're less intense, they're less frequent, and they last less. So the duration, you know, they used to have a 45 minute meltdown. Well, now they're having a 20 minute meltdown. Or now it's gone to 10 minutes. We're making progress here because it's hard to know. So, when you notice there's decreasing in intensity, frequency, and duration, you know you're making progress. Um, okay, so let's focus on the first piece of the pie. So attachment-focused family therapy is very important. Um, they say that if you do this 30% of the time, you will create secure attachment in your child. And just think about that. You, Parents are not superheroes. We are not expected to do things 100% of the time. But if we do it 30% of the time, you will facilitate security in your child. And that's your goal as a parent, to provide security. Your child feels safe coming to you with whatever they're experiencing or feeling or thinking. That's security. When I reach out, you're there for me. So... Safety, how do you be a source of safety? You must be aware of your seven nonverbal cues. And the seven nonverbal cues are be aware of how you're looking at your child. And we may not realize that we're starting to dysregulate and our eyes start widening and we're not being a source of safety anymore <laughs> because kids are reading our nonverbal signals all the time. Are you a source Mm -hmm. of safety or are you a source of distress? So we have to be very aware of how we're looking at our child. That's the first nonverbal signal. The second, our tone of voice, how we're talking to them. In the attachment world, they say it's having a high C note. And when you have a stance of curiosity, when you see anything, it actually raises your voice to a source of safety. So be aware of your tone of voice so the children can come closer to you, not distance them. Yeah. Um, be aware of how your your face. Are you uh, tense in your face, your, your facial characteristics? Are you squinting your forehead? Is it a source of safety or is it a source of distress? And you can ask yourself, how, hmm, I'm aware right now I'm, I'm not providing safety. So tone of voice, eye contact, facial characteristics, your posture, the way you're holding your body. Are you slouched? Are you looking tired? Are you um, double negative, folding your arms and folding your legs over, which is not a source of, oh, I'm available and here for you. Um, so be aware of your posture. Or do you have your hand on your hip? Um, sometimes we're not aware, and we we display behavior that was displayed towards us as children from our own parents, families of origin. And we're doing we're not realizing we're doing the same thing our mother or father did to us. Then there's gestures. You know, are you pointing? Are you? Shaking your hands. Are you putting your hands up? My foster mother used to do this all the time. She'd put her hands up to God, like I was, and I felt like a burden. Like, what is she saying? Like, she can't handle me. Now she's going to God. It was very confusing. So 
how what you're gesturing with your hands is also a form of communication. Is it safe? Is it not safe? So always reading your your nonverbal cues and what you're putting out to your child. Um, and the last one is timing and intensity of response. So your timing, following your child's rhythm. Are you not following? Are you moving too fast? Pace is really important with kids with attachment challenges. Attuning to how fast or slow they're moving. Slow down your own movement. And intensity of response. How fast are you responding? How slow? Is it is it too slow? Is it too fast? Is it too aggressive? So focus on a balance and being a source of safety. Um, Beautiful. I'm, I have something yeah. on, along that line. One is, of course, how, however you're feeling internally is pretty difficult not for it to be displayed. So that's a lot of times people um, say, well, just act like you're calm. But what I'd like to invite would be you just go ahead and step back and take some deep breaths and try to see if you can get to the place where you are calm. Yeah. And the other thought that I found really helpful, and I know this is so dorky, but we've all got these phones in our hands these days, and the next time you're frustrated with your child, instead of fussing at them, as long as they're safe, go to your car <laughs> and turn that video camera on and fuss, and you will see how you look, and you won't realize, I mean, you have no idea. <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea how much intensity I was displaying without meaning to. Right, right, right. Yeah, I had an old supervisor say, you know what, Jeanette, you're looking overly concerned, which to a child can be interpreted as I'm questioning them or interrogating them. And I didn't realize the way I was looking. My intention was to be compassionate but the way I looked was not compassionate, and it was scary. And I, once I made the change, my face opened up. I was more curious, less interrogating. And so we may have an intention, but the way we're being perceived by our child is a totally different. Mm-hmm. So being aware of your nonverbal cues is key in being an attachment-informed therapist. Um and there's a great program called How Does Your Engine Run, which is for parents and children. And that's part of the sensory piece that I'm going to get into. Um, and it's helping you read through your senses. What am I needing right now? What do I need to soothe? Maybe I'm nervous and my engine, which is your body, is feeling off-road right now. I'm actually moving too slow or I'm feeling like I'm moving too fast and I'm overwhelmed and what do I need to get my engine running just right? So it's through the five senses that we soothe our bodies and our sensations to calm our nervous system. And I love that program. I use that in my office all the time. And I teach kids ways to self-soothe, how to get in touch with their bodies and their sensations. Is your engine running too fast? Okay, what do we need to get your engine running just right, slowing it down? Um, So that's a great program for parents because they have a sensory checklist for you to choose items that will help you when you're feeling dysregulated. Um, It could be breathing in lavender, which I do all the time with um, kids in my office and parents breathing in lavender to calm the mind, to calm the body, utilizing play, Play-Doh, uh, even, you know, the latest fad is the um, slime, getting yourself to do something with your hands because that's self-soothing for you. So through the five senses, sight, sound, um, smell, taste, and touch, which one helps you utilize and connect with your body in order to regulate your nervous system. So um, so 30% of the time, being aware of your nonverbal signals, seeing your child, telling them what you're seeing, because a lot of kids don't even see themselves. I see you're upset. I see you're having a lot of big feelings right now. So tell them what you're seeing so that they feel seen, heard, and received. Um there's a lot of talk now about getting below your child's eye level. 
in and staying in a relaxed posture when you do want to communicate or talk to them because it actually, in the research, it actually lowers the stress response in the brain when someone is below eye contact. It's less threatening, um, which also shows you're empathetic. You're telling them you're right here. Um, it, it, they say it, it activates this adaptive neural network in the brain, in the brain, which would promote cooperation. So your child feels heard, and there's a form of connection that is created. So, um, and doing those will promote, again, that security and safety in the relationship. There's another piece of this, and it's called PACE. This is an acronym I teach all my families. Is PACE. Use PACE it's in, when approaching your child. So PACE, P, stands for be playful. And these are all attitudes you have with your child. Be playful. Laughter promote, promotes memories. Do playful activities as much as possible because this will facilitate bonding. Parents don't attach to their children. They learn to bond and fall in love with their children. So there's a difference. When I hear a parent saying, oh, I'm attaching to my child. Oh, red flag. Um, you should have done that with your own parents. But your job is to promote bonding and bond with your child. So be playful do uh, parallel play, movement, um, jumping activities, swinging together. It's okay for a parent to be a kid again. Because sometimes we as parents don't know how to be playful. So when you're playful with your child, it actually creates this parallel and helps again create that sense of safety and security in that relationship. So P is playful. A is Always convey, I accept you, my child. I may not accept your behavior, but you put the emphasis on that. However, I accept you. And I'm going to talk about shame in a minute, helping separate the child from their behavior so they can see what's happening. Um, so, and conveying is 90% of nonverbal communication. So, you may say, with your tone of voice, oh, I'm not mad, but you're conveying in your body you're mad because your stance is somewhat tense. So work on, and there's a tool in attachment um, treatment. As much as you can, maybe two, three times a day, when you see your child, use your body, without words, to convey, I love you, I'm here for you, I'm looking out for you. And you'll feel something shift within you. And there's yes. a sense of thing. That's, and, that's real right there. Um, real. Be, yeah. Some, I think, I, sometimes um, yeah. parents get in such a position of frustration and they're at such a loss. And so just that yeah. trying to bridge that's that lovely. gap, is a, that's a yeah. beautiful way to do it, that convey. I've yeah. even had parents go in and... and just watch their kids while they're sleeping or even sit in their empty room yeah. until they can get to, to that place where they can do that face-to-face. Yeah, because we can become exhausted and we're, we're frustrated and we do need to fill ourselves up and see our children. Accept your child. They are doing the best that they can. We must have this attitude. It's not that they won't behave, it's because they can't. They're communicating, I don't know what else to do, Mom, Dad. I don't know. That's why I'm acting out like this. I need help. So um, so really work on accepting your child. You may not accept their behavior. You can have the anger and frustration towards the behavior. But communicate, I accept you unconditionally. I may not like what you're when you throw the plate at the wall or throw my cell phone in the pool, however, I accept you. So that's where the emphasis is. And then C is be curious. Always have a stance of curiosity. And this is a practice. Pace is a practice. This is a tool. So anytime you see any behavior with your child, you go, okay, which one am I going to do? P-A-C or E? And E is have empathy. So you get to choose 
where which approach you're going to use with your child. And it's a really nice tool because it can feel very overwhelming parenting a child with a trauma history, and, and you don't have a compass or a, 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 a north, south, east, or west. That's why I like PACE. Because it's a nice acronym. It helps you just slow things down. I go, okay, let me pace myself. <laughs> um, yes. And let, which one am I going to choose right now? Let me be curious because pacing with your child facilitates that attachment. You're a source of safety, not a source of distress. So, um, all right, I was just realizing, oh, my gosh, there's so much to go over. So I'm going to go through shame right now. Um, okay. And how to recognize if your child is experiencing shame. This also for me, and then maybe parents on the line who have a child similar, who has a similar story to myself, I didn't realize until I became a therapist how much shame I actually had. Um, Shame is like this. It's like a bubble that the child has around them. And in the bubble is a mirror. And the bubble in the mirror represents all they see in that mirror is their bad self. So they see they're deficient, there's something wrong about them, and this is based on what happened to them. They've formed this belief system. There's there's something um, uh, there's something wrong about me, I'm unworthy, I'm invaluable, I'm just a piece of garbage. And I used to think I was a piece, literally a piece of garbage. Um So what shame does is when a child is experiencing this about themselves, when a parent says and points out something that they've done wrong or they've made a mistake, the child becomes enraged because when a parent says, you know, what's wrong with you, which I tell all my families, don't say that ever (laughs) because you're implying there's something wrong about you. And for a child with shame, it fuels that shame. There is something wrong about this. They can't, these kids can't differentiate themselves from their behavior. So one of the red flags is you have a child who's living with shame is when you point out a mistake, they get very defensive and they feel like, I'm the mistake, I'm all wrong. They can't look at that the mistake is the mistake. All they see is, I'm the mistake. When they do something wrong and you point it out, they feel all wrong. So what happens is a lot of parents' traditional approach is I need to instill responsibility for my child. So when they do something wrong, I need them to go take responsibility and go apologize. Well, what I learned and experience as a child when I was forced to go apologize. This is what it felt like, and I always asked it out so parents can feel it. I would be forced to go apologize to your brother for kicking him or whatever I did wrong, right? So I, of course, would resist, defend, not want to, and at the same time, I needed my parent. I needed the approval of my parent. So I felt I had to, I really had no choice, because I may lose the love of my parent if I don't do this. So as a child, this is what happens. They're forced to go and apologize, and they go up to their brother or sister or whoever they did the wrong to, and they go up to them, and this is what they feel like. They go, oh, I'm sorry. And they're just standing there saying, oh, I'm sorry. But what are they saying I'm sorry for? Because they can't they can't differentiate themselves from their behavior. They're saying, I'm sorry, I'm so bad. And they feel it reinforces their shame. And this is why we have multiple kids and multiple foster homes, because parents are in trauma and form. They can't say. I'm sorry for what I did to you, which is called guilt. When a child experiences shame, it impedes the development of guilt. So what a parent needs to do, and I'm sure a lot of you are right now going, oh, that's my kid, um, or that's even me, because I recognize this about myself, oh, my gosh, is it's called the sandwich metaphor. So there's the sandwich bread on the bottom. 
you must separate your child from their behavior. So when you recognize something that they've done and you want to teach them and help them become aware so we change behavior, is you point out with the bread on the bottom, you're a good person. We love you. We care about you. You're important. That's the validation. That's the connection first. Then we focus on the correction, which is the turkey, the meat, the lettuce, the onion, the pickle. And we put emphasis on we don't like it when you throw my cell phone in the pool. That's not okay. It's not okay to do that. Then the bread on top is we love you. You're important. You matter. And what this, and what I also tell parents is you need to model on a daily basis. And you find any which way you can. When you realize you've made a mistake, Co, I'm sorry that I hurt your feelings, that I hurt you. I'm sorry that I yelled. I didn't mean to do that. I'm going to figure out a better way next time. Walk away, take care of myself so that it doesn't affect our relationship. So parents apologize, but really putting emphasis on their behavior. I'm sorry when I did this, and that hurt you. And I'm going to tell you, I've had families go, that was the single most important thing you helped me understand. It changes the whole dynamic. Yes. When you can separate your child from their behavior, you're going to see your child differently. That's being attachment informed. You're going to accept them. You may not accept their behavior, but you're always conveying, I accept you. You have value in this family. You're important. And I can I want to say, as an adoptee and a foster youth, we do not become narcissists. We cannot hear enough that we are good enough, that we mean enough, that we are enough, that we're capable. We need to hear it over and over and over because there's a shoot in us. It goes in one ear and it goes shooting out the other. It's like it, the repetition, eventually, the more we hear it, the more we will believe it. And our self-esteem is boosted. But we need repetition from our parents because there's a part of us that just doesn't feel valuable, worthy, and important. So um, this is a really important piece. Um did you want to say something, Christy, about that? No, but I, I was I was just thinking about how profound that understanding of shame is. And yeah. th- what's interesting about it is when you think about how um, descended, how highly descended a lot of kids are when you approach them with something that they've done wrong, a mistake, and so they're so quick to defend, but... When you can step back and practice some of the things that you're teaching us and and keeping ourselves regulated and seeing them as doing the best that they can and you have that lens, you immediately sense that that defendedness that we all get so scared about, right underneath it is shame. It's yes. And it's so powerful. And, and it, it's so powerful that that is why they are so defended because if you... If you if you could reach in and see and just feel that burden that that's that's being carried under shame, gosh, that's heavy. And the way you yeah. um the way you paint that picture of like a mirror that all, and all they can see themselves, they can't even see past themselves right. and how bad they are and how horrible and how intrinsically awful they are to see what it is you're trying to correct about. Right. And and it's that it's that piece. You're a good person. This yeah. is what's not you're right. a good person. You can do this. We know this. And this is what we need to figure out. Let's problem solve and figure out what we can do about this. And uh, here I am saying, because I, I do full six hour trauma training here in Los Angeles. And get out of the you, I, we. We, we. uh huh, absolutely. More so that you share in the problem solving that you're not the problem. The problem is the problem. 
um, we're going to fix this. We're going to figure out what to do to help us with this problem. We, us, um, thinking. So um, I was going to talk about, because I shared with Christy when we talked about the content of this call, was I, I shared earlier, I have a YouTube channel. What happened for me as a therapist was I was going to all these trainings about theory, and then I thought, well, what do you do? Like, mm-hmm. I needed people to help me express myself through art, through creating a narrative, through letting out my big angry feelings. So I started creating interventions specifically designed for this population, and I just started developing them, working on symptoms, helping take the shame out of even going to therapy because kids mm-hmm. can feel like, oh, there's something wrong about me now. I gotta they, get, they get tired of being viewed as the problem. Yeah, of exactly. course. So, and a lot of my interventions include the parent and the child. They're for kids as young as three or as old as 18. So if my book is on Amazon and has the interventions listed, um, I think there's like 25 in the book. And online on my YouTube channel, you can access, I think, probably 15 of them when I explain them piece by piece of how you do it, what what um, what tools you need, um, and why it's effective and why it's necessary to do this intervention. So one of the interventions that I developed came from my own relationship with my own adoptive mother. She could see in me that I was tense a lot, I was holding on to a lot of feelings, it was very hard for me to cry, I felt very ashamed of my feelings, I felt like nobody would understand me, so I would keep it all inside, so she would nightly have me just punch my pillow, and I would just punch it, punch it, punch it, until after a few nights, I eventually started to be able to discharge and release feelings, and I would start ended up I would end up crying because I had so much pent up anger, and the anger is all about defending against the pain. That's what anger is, and there's a a free tool. It's called the Anger Wheel. You can look it up on Google. You pick up Anger Wheel, and I tell my parents print this out, put it up on your wall. Um, so kids understand anger is a protective mechanism against many other feelings. So what I understood with my anger was I would punch the pillow, go through the break through the anger and get down to my sadness. And I would cry and I would let out my feelings and then my mom would hold me and she would contain these feelings that I had. And I just needed her to be able to tolerate my grief. Because I had a lot that I was mm. feeling sorry for. And mm-hmm. I needed her to feel sorry with me. And a lot of these kids need their parents to just know I'm hurting, I'm grieving. Don't try to fix me. Please be with me and and, mm. and, and, and contain, hold these with me. So a parent needs to be aware of their own triggers about grief and their own unresolved grief. And it can be hard. And it's okay, I tell parents to tear up, to feel your child's feelings with them because when they see, wow, my feelings actually have impact, they have impact. So it's really powerful. So what one of my interventions is called hold on to my feelings. So what I do is I have kids, I get old phone books, and I go, you know what, your mom, your dad, grandma, your aunt, we recognize that you must have a lot of big feelings that you're holding on to. So today we're going to release them by ripping up this phone book. And guess what? You don't, you don't get to clean it up. Your parents get to clean it up. Well, that entices most kids to do this exercise. <laughs> <laughs> they don't need to clean it up. So I teach kids what's called I messages. Say what you feel. I feel mad and when this happens. So you whip out a piece of the phone book, you state your I message. I feel really mad when this happens or something that's happening now or in the past. Whip up the paper and I want you to release those feelings in the air. It can be very cathartic for a child. And of course I do this in my therapy office and I do tell parents, designate a place that you will do this with your child at home 
so that it provides the same therapeutic containment as it is provided in the, in the therapy office. You can do this at home. So the child gets to rip up all their feelings, all their feelings, and then when they've released and they're usually exhausted, I say, oh, you get to go now sit down and relax because you've just done some really hard work and expressing and releasing your feelings, and now mom, dad, or grandma, they're going to go sit in your feelings and feel what it feels like to be in your feelings. Mm. And this is where parents are able to recognize the brain and that tsunami amount of feelings that a lot of these kids are experiencing and their big acting out behaviors. It's a mess in there. And I have parents just sit there and I go, wow, what does it feel like to be in Johnny's feelings right now? It's a lot, right? Now you get to pick up these feelings piece by piece, and I want you to tell your child what you're going to do. I want you to have empathy, how you're going to help, how you're going to be with these feelings. So I have parents pick up a bunch of the feelings, and I go, and these are not going in the garbage. These are valuable. We're going to hold these feelings in a um, pillowcase. We usually have an old pillowcase. And I have the parent put the feelings in one by one. And I've had, and I go, I want you to hold these feelings in your hand and speak to them. And I have the child sit there, and I give them a sippy juice, and I go, you just relax. You just take in what your mom or your dad's going to say right now. And the parent is empathizing. I've had parents cry. I've had parents go, I'm so sorry. I didn't know this is how big it felt. I'm going to help hold these with you. And once. They're all placed in the bag, and the parent has picked them all up. I ask the parent, now you get to hold these feelings, because he can't hold these all by himself. He needs you to help him hold these feelings. That's what a parent's job is. And then the parent holds on to them. They bring them in their room. They take them home. And throughout the week and weeks to come, they continue to do this exercise. I instruct parents, without the child knowing, Throughout the week, when you're doing the dishes, the laundry, I want you to go pick up that bag of feelings. I want you to put it on your shoulder, wrap it in your bra strap or your shoulder strap, walk around the house holding those feelings. And your child is going to look at you and go, huh, wait a second, is that my feelings you're holding on to? Do not say anything. Just look at your child nonverbally conveying, I've got your back. I have you. I'm with you. It can be extremely powerful. And then I had one parent who went back to her room, went to go put down the bag of feelings. And she had another aha moment. And she said, Jeanette, I went to put down the feelings and I realized, wow, I can put down this feeling. But my child." And that was really big for her. And I think this exercise really helps parents go, I'm going to stay compassionate. I'm going to stay empathic and understanding how complex and overwhelming these feelings are. And I'm not going to give up. And so that intervention came from my own childhood experience, my own mother's attempt to help me reorganize myself and provide this sense of connection, safety. Um, So that I do with all my families. It's extremely powerful. So I highly recommend. That's beautiful. That is so beautiful. I love it. I absolutely love that. (laughs) Yes. Attachment piece. So uh, let me just go through the rest of the pieces of the pie so I cover all those pieces. And they're they're less intricate. But so the attachment piece is so crucial. It's a big part of the work that I do. So the second piece of the pie I talked about creating that narrative. So you can go to my YouTube channel. There are two um, two videos. One is the family tree video, how to map your child's story, especially if they've been in multiple placements, and then how to create a question box with your child. Because these kids are walking around with like an imaginary puzzle above them, looming above them, and they're trying to put these pieces together. So we want to be, again, a container 
have these external interventions to help them make sense, organize, and contain all of these pieces. Um, so the third piece is understanding the sensory signals. I think I talked about that. Um, how does your engine run? There's a great book by Peter Levine called Trauma Through a Child's Eyes. He also has a CD called It Won't Hurt Forever. And so he teaches, and I can teach you it right now, sensation techniques. Because when children, children are having feelings, it's the neurophysiological connection. There's a neurological, there's a thought response, and then there's a feeling and a sensation that happens in the body. In treating a child who's experienced trauma, we want to, and this comes from Dan Siegel, we want to name it to tame it and reorganize it. So we want to ask the child, you know, what are you feeling and where are you feeling it in your body? Wow, that, you're feeling anger. Okay, where are you feeling that in your body? Then getting the child to externalize it, can you draw that? Can you show me with the Play-Doh what it looks like? And then if they're re-experiencing that feeling right then and there, go, yeah, okay, we, I, I feel that with you. We can be, be in this feeling. Because it's the working through and tolerating that helps them work through it and move through and discharge the feeling. And they need another person to do that with them. So it's teaching them how to connect to their feeling, the sensation, be and tolerate the feeling, because children have an innate ability. Children are resilient to work through it. They just need someone to help pull it out, name it, be with it, and work through it. So that piece is really important. Um, fourth piece of the pie is understanding the brain connection. And I have another video called Teaching Kids the Hand Model of the Brain. So that is a video for kids. I tell them how our brain works, and it's through that hand model of the brain. Because this is a psychoeducation piece. I want kids to know this happens for all of us, not just you. All, we all struggle with that reptilian fight, flight, freeze part of our brains when we feel scared or stressed out. And there are things we can do in order to cope with our feelings and our sensations. And I teach eye messages in there. And then there's another video called Just Breathe, which I highly recommend you all watch. And I'll watch this with kids. And then we practice breathing with lavender. So, there, so this segment is about the bilateral stimulation piece. And the research shows that bilateral stimulation does help integrate and reorganize our brains. Our brains are like a computer. And children who have traumatized brains, it's not working in sync correctly. So, like, neurofeedback is very effective with this population. Um, attachment focus EMDR. There's different types of EMDR. So I want to be very clear. You want to work with an attachment-focused EMDR specialist because um, you don't want to re-traumatize children and who works with children. There's a technique called tapping in. So tapping in is uh, you place both your hands on either one of your knees, so your right hand on your right knee, your left hand on your left knee, and you tap in a resource, which is we're going to tap in a peaceful place. And we don't tap in a safe place. We're going to tap in a peaceful place because the safe word can be very triggering for kids. So I tell kids, you can utilize your imagination, which you have accessibility to all the time, to help calm your mind and your body with tapping in. They can do it whenever they want. Um, and so they, they imagine themselves. I want you to see you in your mind's eye. They close their eyes. See yourself in a peaceful place. I want you to use all your senses to connect with it. And once you're there, we're going to tap right, left. Here we go. Tap, 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 tap. And you tap about 12 to 20 times. So they're tapping in this sensational experience of being in a peaceful place. And this bilateral approach 
actually reintegrates into the brain and the body and gives them a greater sense of well-being. They also can tap in, and I always ask kids, a wise figure, a protective figure, or a loving nurturing, nurturing figure. And these figures can be in the forms of animals, superheroes. When they think of a, of a protective figure, what does that look like? I had one child who was scared to sleep at night, and he would had early trauma. He was in a Russian orphanage multiple placements, and he had trouble sleeping and regulating his nervous system. So we resourced and tapped in, first his peaceful place, then his protective figure. And his protective figure was sharks surrounding him, protecting him and providing this container so he could have a feeling of relief so he could sleep. Every night he tapped in these sharks, And eventually he didn't have to tap in anymore because he had already integrated this sense in his mind and in his body. So tapping in is very effective with this population. There's another bilateral approach called, they were called buzzies. Now they're called touch points. And you can go to their website, touch points. And they're actually wristbands for kids that stimulate the child through um, physical sensation. Um, I also utilize Alpha Stim, A L P H A S T I M, uh, and this also is a form of touch, and it's through the earlobe, and they feel a little stimulation. It's, a, it's an electro stimulation, and it after they do a 40 minute, they don't have to do anything. They can watch TV, they can do their art. I talk to them in therapy, and we talk about this, and. They don't have to do anything, and they feel a sense of, ah, relief. So, um, and there's one more, which is neurological reorganization, um, and that's a form of movement that um, is done on a daily basis, which, again, reorganizes the brain and the body and the ability to self-regulate. So I highly recommend you look at any one of those treatments to approach this piece of the pie. And I also recommend teaching mindfulness techniques. Um, and there are great apps called Breathe, Stop, Relax, and Think, Headspace. And one of my favorite CDs right now is Sitting Still Like a Frog. And it helps kids, again, gain awareness of their bodies, slow their bodies down so they can um, feel a sense of relief. Um, the fifth piece of the time will go like probably 10 more minutes. Is that okay? That's fine, Jeanette. You go as okay. long as you have time for um, them. And then I'll have, I'll have to go. But um, So the fifth piece is the nutrition. Um, I'm working with an adoptive parent, and if anyone wants the resource, I can give this to you, and you can provide this as a follow-up to the call, Christy. She's an adoptive parent who does supplemental um, uh, nutrients. She provides a resource of supplemental nutrients for children based on their 23andMe DNA test. Because what she's found is looking at their 23andMe DNA test, she can tell what areas they may be deficient in nutrients and provide them with the right supplements. Because kids in utero, again, may not have received the proper amino acids, which are crucial for brain development. Um, One of them is called GABA. G-A-B-A, and that is for brain stimulation. And if we don't have enough GABA in our in our brain stem, our brain stem is not going to work well enough for self-regulation. So that's one of the supplements that she recommends. Now, before you do anything of this sort, she would recommend you um, meet with your doctor to make sure that it's okay that your child can go on a supplemental program. But this is a nutritional approach a natural approach to healing, which I'm a big fan of. I Psychotropic medications is a last resort. I always say you must utilize all these pieces of the pie first before going because a psychotropic medication, all it is is a buffer, and it's not treating the symptoms. It's just buffering the symptoms um, and keeping it dormant. We want to be able to go straight to the symptoms 
soothe it, give it what it needs, so that we don't have to rely on any, any psychotropic medication, so that we can rely on our natural, resilient human body symptom, system, which is capable of repairing itself with the right intervention. So I can provide you with this resource of this parent who is really helping. I have two kids right now on the supplemental program, and we have seen a drastic change in her ability to think through situations. She doesn't get as reactive. She can slow down more. She's more self-aware. I mean, it has been amazing. So that's why I'm telling you, these supplements can really help kids in a natural way. And without therapy, without doing a bilateral approach, calm the nervous system. Reorganize. Give it what it needs. So, um, and I always say limit processed sugar um, because a lot of kids who are in survival mode, um, they actually burn calories fast. They need a high-protein diet. I was a kid. I ate a lot of processed sugar. I had hypoglycemia. I would all of a sudden be feeling really out of sorts. I would feel lightheaded. I would faint. I wouldn't know what was happening. And it's because I was burning so many calories all the time because I was in a high-anxiety state a lot. And I recognized I needed a high-protein diet, and I've even recognized that as an adult. Um, so just be aware of that piece. And then the book I was telling you about, when, if you have a child with food issues, it's Hang on. Love yes. Did you did you um, did you want to give the name of the person? I'll give it to you. So if anyone wants to contact her directly, because I can I can email, include it in the email. Is that yes, okay? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Great. The book for food issues is called Love Me, Feed Me. And then the last piece um, is the parenting piece, and that's the parent providing um, support to yourself and to other parents. And I always tell parents um, it's important to have a listening partner and have someone who you can call who can listen to you without judgment, uh, who doesn't try to fix you, who doesn't give you unsolicited advice, uh, who can acknowledge and just be a sort a listening partner. Really important. When we we need someone to share our experiences with. Parenting is hard for any parent, let alone a child who's experienced trauma. So that's really important. And then utilizing pace on yourself. Just like I said, utilize it approach with your child. Do it for yourself. Be playful with yourself. This is hard work. Accept yourself. You may not accept, you know, you messed up or you became angry or upset. Accept yourself. You know, let yourself off the hook. This is hard work. Um, be curious with what you're feeling and thinking and have empathy for yourself. Um, and please find a support group that's really important. I have a support group here in Los Angeles if there are any callers um, that I do. Um, but parents need the support of other parents. And then the last one is a CD that I use with a lot of my parents. It's called The Hope Filled Parent. It's a CD of meditations for foster and adoptive parents of children who've been harmed. And I cannot speak more highly of this meditation CD. Um, there are a few tracks, I Get Tired and I Forget, uh, Meltdown at Walmart, My Parenting Stance for Today, and they're all meditations, how to stay attachment focused, how to step back, see your child as a child who's struggling, see yourself as a parent who's doing the best that you can, and have compassion for yourself and have compassion for your child. So I did send you a link, which I hope you can provide in the follow-up to this call, my parenting stance for today so they can hear one of the meditations. They're absolutely beautiful. I tell parents before you pick your child up from school, listen to a five-minute meditation. Mm-hmm. You can stay calm and regulated in your own body and 
stay attachment, loving, curious, and empathic with your child and with yourself. So I hope I provided a lot of information <laughs> in an hour and a half. So I hope this is helpful. Anything that I missed that we talked about, Christy, that I didn't include? <laughs> sure. Oh, Jeanette, I just... Uh... I don't want to keep you um, because Aww. I know you've got things to do, but I cannot yeah, express my- to you. I mean, I I cannot. I, you, I have so many things written down. I'm going to include everything that you've talked about when I re-listen. The email's just going to be detailed out with all these links because, you know, I could sit there and listen and then, you know, continue to use what you've said in our calls, but you have been so generous that it just makes me want to do everything I can to make it as simple for anyone who signed up to get this to be able to get through it. Because you did. You gave us a lot. And I know, I mean, everything that you said, this is solid stuff, people. I mean, it is solid as could be. And she just wrapped it up right here for us. (laughs) Oh, my God. Thank you you for your generosity. I can't even, I can't appreciate it too much. So well, I wish you all well. Do the best that you can, and that's good enough. That's good enough. Thirty percent of the time, you're a good enough parent. So, I wish you all well and happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> uh, thank you, dear. Thank you so much. Happy Thanksgiving to okay, you and thanks. to all the inner circle members. Thank you for all that you do in creating healing in the lives of our our sweet, vulnerable, sensitive children. Yeah. Much love yeah. to you all. All right. Good night, Jeanette. Good night.